Good afternoon. So uh, you may have noticed that um, on each of my slides there's a quotation. I like quotations. They're sort of tied to the subject matter of each lecture. And this one's by Erwin Shargoff. Does anybody know what he did? Shargoff's rules, like A equals T and G equals C, right? He used to work up at the medical center where I am. He was a very unhappy man. He was very unhappy that he didn't get the Nobel Prize when the structure of DNA was solved. Because remember, Watson and Crick, important part of their structure was the equality of the bases, the complementarity of the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's. Anyway, this quote is perfect because he's right. Nucleic acids and proteins have an interplay. The nucleic acids specify the proteins among which are enzymes that replicate the genomes. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about the virus genome. What kind of genomes are in virus particles? How they are expressed and give rise to new virus particles. What they encode, what they don't encode. How small and how large they are. And most, perhaps most importantly, how we can manipulate these genomes in the laboratory. We can manipulate them to, for our benefit to study viruses and to make them do what we want. The last lecture of this course is going to be on viral gene therapy, using viruses to cure cancers, to vaccinate, to deliver drugs. And all of that depends on being able to manipulate the genome. So today is a crucial lecture. I'll, I want you to try and focus on the principles here and remember them because if you do, it's going to make everything else easier. Knowing the nature of the genome can help a lot in understanding subsequent steps in replication. <clears throat> now, if you, may, you may remember that in the 1940s, DNA was shown to be the genetic material of bacterial cells. It wasn't until the 1950s that the viral genome, the nucleic acid, was shown to be the genetic material for viruses. There are two key experiments that showed that. On the left, <clears throat> the so-called Hershey Chase experiment with bacteriophage T4. That's an electron micrograph on the left of phage T4. Lovely. Just isn't it a lovely picture? A most beautiful virus. Well, they're all beautiful in my view, but this is really, really beautiful. I'm going to tell you about the Hershey Chase experiment in a moment, but you probably learned this in high school, right? Hershey Chase? Yes? No? Okay. Whether you did or not, we'll learn it again. It's very easy. And on the right is the Frankel Conrad experiment with tobacco mosaic virus, that rod shaped virus. Remember the first virus. Uh, to be identified. It turns out that this virus is going to be used over and over again in seminal discoveries in virology. F first virus discovered, now we're going to see how investigators used it to prove that the RNA inside of it is the genetic material. Okay, Hershey Chase, first of all. Uh, Alfred Hershey on the right here, he was a professor uh, where he did this experiment, was actually at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories out on Long Island. And he had a technician, Martha Chase, shown here. And in 1952, they did this experiment. It's the famous kitchen blender experiment. They wanted to know, in a phage particle, was it the protein or the nucleic acid that contained the information to make more phages? Now, today we take it for granted, of course, that it's nucleic acid, which is correct. But back then, there was this big debate. Some people thought the proteins were the genetic material because they're way more complicated than nucleic acids. You know, you have 21 amino acids in all different combinations, whereas nucleic acid, they have four bases. And that seemed overly simple. So Chase and Hershey wanted to sort this out. So what they did is they did an experiment where they radioactively labeled bacteriophages either with sulfur to label the proteins or with phosphorus to label the viral DNA. So this phage has DNA in it. They would then adsorb this, these labeled viruses in separate experiments to E. coli cells for a very short period of time, enough to let the DNA get inside of the cell, which they figured out beforehand, of course. They did time courses. And then they stopped the, the uh, infection by putting the 
bacteria with the virus on them in a kitchen blender. And they blended it, and this sheared off the phage so no more radioactivity could get in. And then they ask, uh, where is the radioactivity? And if you let the infection go, where, in the new phages that are produced, where is the radioactivity? So what they found is that when you label the phages with S35 to label the proteins, and you do the shearing in the blender, the radioactivity is predominantly in the supernatant. So when the phages come off, they're in the supernatant fraction. That's where the label is. And then when you uh, let the infection continue, the DNA is already in the cell. Uh, the new phages that are produced, there's no radioactivity in them. If you label the DNA, the DNA gets in the cell after the shearing, and then some of the new phages have radioactive DNA. So there's a famous experiment, and he spent the rest of his career doing this experiment over and over with different permutations. And today there's a saying, <clears throat> when you have a system, an experimental system working, you're in Hershey heaven, because you can keep doing the same experiment over and over again, just tweaking things and, I mean, it's valuable stuff, don't let me denigrate it, but that's where it came from. So there they are, and here is the blender, or one of the blenders he used. If you go out to Cold Spring Harbor, they have a library there, it's called the Carnegie Library, and you can see a blender uh, in behind glass, it's right there, with a little uh, letter from Chase himself. So that's the Hershey Chase experiment showing the DNA is a genetic material of viruses. Now later on today, we'll see another experiment that was done more recently that validates this conclusion. Okay, today we're gonna talk about all the kinds of nucleic acids that are present in virus particles. And I told you in the very first lecture that there are lots and lots of different kinds of viruses out there, all different shapes and sizes, and they're in us and around us but we can actually simplify that down because it turns out there's a finite number of virus genomes. And here in New York, we have a sign that tells us that, the number seven subway. All you have to do is remember that and you'll know the number of virus genomes. There's seven different genome types in viruses. So just think subway, that's your mnemonic for this because you have to remember this. If you remember the number, you could actually go through all the different configurations of nucleic acids and list them all for me on a piece of paper. Seven different viral genomes. And the other uh, issue that helps us to put all of this multiplicity of viruses in order is that they all have to make messenger RNA that can be read by ribosomes because no virus makes a protein translation system in the infected cell. They are translational parasites and they have to make mRNA that can be read by ribosomes. So here's our ribosome. Do you think it looks like a turkey? It does, doesn't it? So that's, that's what we've got for our icon for ribosomes. All viruses have to do this. We haven't found one yet that makes its own ribosomes and can use those for translation. So that's something that all viruses have to do in common, make mRNA uh, that can be read by cellular ribosomes. Now back in the 1970s, David Baltimore, a Nobel laureate, took this, these two facts, and in, in specifically the one uh, that says that viruses have to make mRNA that's readable by host ribosomes, and he organized all the known viruses at the time into this scheme. This is called the Baltimore scheme. Here he is over here, he likes to fish. Um, I actually worked with him many years ago, very exciting place to work, very smart man, and this Baltimore scheme is his thinking. What he said is, all virus genomes have to get to mRNA. So let's make a scheme with mRNA in the middle here. You can see plus mRNA. And then let's see how the different genomes get to it. So he, he assigned six different classes of genome in this scheme. And let's start with class one, double-stranded DNA. From double-stranded DNA, you can make mRNA. So that's a very simple pathway to mRNA. Uh, class two is single-stranded DNA. Now here's a fact for you to remember. You can only make mRNA, in, in the case of DNA viruses, from double-stranded templates. It can't be single-stranded, it can't be gap double-stranded, it has to be fully duplex double-stranded DNA. So if you have a single-stranded uh, DNA virus, first thing that has to happen, it has to be made double-stranded and then you can make uh, mRNA. Class three are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes, now, double-stranded RNA consists of a plus and minus strand, an mRNA and an anti-mRNA strand, but ribosomes can't access 
the plus strand in double-stranded RNA. So these uh, viruses have to copy this double-stranded RNA and make uh, a fresh mRNA, if you will, to be translated. Class four uh, is viruses with plus-stranded RNA. Now, many of these, the plus RNA is actually messenger RNA and can be translated directly. So many people get confused here because I have a negative strand template uh, in the middle here going to mRNA. Uh, that's not needed for many of the plus-stranded RNA viruses, but we do show it because it's a way of getting more plus-stranded RNA. So it's a little bit of the oddball out in this scheme. So suffice it to say that viruses with a single-stranded plus-stranded RNA genome uh, in many cases can be directly translated, but to make more mRNAs, they have to go through a negative strand intermediate. All right, group number five is down here. Uh, viruses with a negative stranded RNA genome. By definition, negative strand is the opposite polarity of plus strand, which is mRNA. Can't be translated, so you have to copy it to make a plus mRNA. And group six is up here. Uh, another unusual group of viruses. These have plus stranded RNAs, but this plus stranded RNA is not translated in the infected cell, even though it could be, it's potentially mRNA. You could take it in vitro and translate it. In the infected cell, it is first copied to DNA, a single-stranded DNA. And again, that has to be copied to a double-stranded DNA before mRNA can be made from it. So those were the six classes that Baltimore put on his scheme. The seventh class in the upper right here wasn't known at the time of when he made this, this chart. Uh, it was added later. This is the gapped double-stranded DNA of hepatitis B viruses, or hepadenoviruses. So this is double-stranded DNA, but it has a gap in one strand, and this cannot be made into mRNA. It has to be repaired first and made completely double-stranded. All the gaps have to be repaired, and then the double-stranded DNA can be used as a template for mRNA synthesis. So a key thing for you to remember here, besides the seven genome types and how they lead to mRNA, is the fact that only double-stranded DNA among the DNA viruses can serve as a template for mRNA synthesis. Yes? So the plus convention, is that semi-synonymous with the sense-stranded? Yeah, it is. So by plus, we mean mRNA polarity. And in fact, I think here are those definitions, all right? So mRNA is always the plus strand. It's simply a convention. Some years, people say, does that have anything to do with charge or electricity? It's nothing to do with either. It's just a convention. Uh, you could have said minus is mRNA years ago when they started this, but they didn't. They said it was plus, and so that's what stuck. The DNA of the equivalent polarity plus is also the plus strand. But it, when you make mRNA, you copy the minus strand of DNA. Right? You don't copy the plus strand, otherwise you would get minus mRNA. And RNA and DNA complements of plus strands, of course, are called minus strands or negative strands. You'll see both in the virology literature. So those are the definitions. And finally, the last point, not all plus RNA is mRNA. So the, the virus group that I showed you that takes plus RNA and makes a DNA copy, those viruses do not translate that mRNA in cells. So not every plus RNA that you see is an mRNA, even though it's the same polarity. It may have the capacity to be translated, but uh, in some cases it's not. So the beauty of this scheme, and I would suggest to you that you look at it a bit and then try writing it out. It's really quite simple. You just put mRNA in the middle and then your seven genome types around it. The beauty is if I give you minus RNA and say, how do you get proteins from this? You can tell me immediately. You can say, well, it's mRNA minus M uh, RNA, so you have to make a messenger RNA from it, and then that can be translated. If I say, how do you get proteins from a single-stranded DNA strand, whether it be minus or plus DNA? And you can say, well, you make it double-stranded, and then you go to mRNA. So it's really a beautiful scheme in that you can immediately tell the gene flow of all the, different, of all the seven classes uh, of viruses. So we use this to this day to sort out our thinking uh, about viruses. <clears throat> so here are the seven classes. You should know these already because we've already gone through them in the Baltimore scheme. Uh, but I do, again, you should remember these seven classes. If I ask you what are the seven classes, you should be able to 
rip them off without thinking, okay? There, there are not a lot of things I, I want you to memorize in this class, but this is one of them because it just is easy to do and it can help answer so many other questions. So we have double-stranded DNA viruses. So again, these are viruses with different kinds of genomes in them. In a family of viruses, they all have the same kind of genome. It doesn't vary within the family. So the kind of genome is characteristic of the virus. We have double-stranded DNA, and we have our gapped double-stranded DNA, the hepatinoviruses, and we have single-stranded DNA. And that's it for DNA. Pretty simple, double-strand, gapped, and single-strand. Of course, it can be linear or circular. Those things will come up later, but the, the key seven features are uh, whether they're single or double-stranded or gap. And we have uh, more kinds of RNA. We have double-stranded RNA. Then we have single-stranded RNA, either plus or minus polarity. And then there's a subset of the plus single-stranded RNAs that are classified separately because these viruses go through a DNA intermediate. All right, the ones that are simply single-stranded plus RNA, they don't go through a DNA intermediate. There's a separate class of viruses, the retroviruses, which we'll talk about a lot, that have a DNA intermediate. So that's why we keep them separate, because they do go through DNA. So that's your seven classes, and this is the basis for a lot of what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about how each of these seven classes replicates and makes more <laughs> virus particles. We'll talk about how they cause disease. We'll talk about vaccination, immune responses, antivirals, and so forth. So when you hear Zika virus, you're going to automatically think at the end of this course, plus stranded RNA. When you hear Ebola, you're going to think negative stranded RNA. Why do you care? Well, let's say one day you're doctors and you're treating a patient with Zika. And you can say, this is a plus stranded flavivirus carried by 80s uh, mosquitoes. And they'll think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> And so they'll be confident in your treatment of them. But if, if they say, what kind of virus is this? You go, um, I don't remember. I don't remember my class in virology. That's not really good, OK? <laughs> They're not going to come back to you. So remember this stuff, and it really helps. It helps in medical school because I teach medical classes on viruses. And these are on the, um, the medical exams. What is it, the ones you take for licensing? Thank you. Um, and many people have come to me and thanked me for teaching them because the, the s same similar questions are on Ver MCATs, for example. A student from last year brought me a copy of a question uh, on issues that we were talking about in this course. So this can be useful. If you don't think it's interesting, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but it can be useful for the 40% of you that would like to be doctors. So the MCATs are what you take to get into medical school, and the boards are what you take to get out. right? And these kinds of questions are on both. All right, let's do a question here. It's question one. Why is mRNA placed at the center of the Baltimore scheme? Because all virus particles contain mRNA. There's no reason. Because all viral genomes are mRNAs. Because all viral genomes must make mRNA. Or because Baltimore studied mRNA. All right, this should be 100%, right? Let's see. How can a DNA virus genome be mRNA, right? Now, I know there's some of you who are playing with me. That happens every year. It's fine. <laughs> no problem. 95% of you got the right answer because all viral genomes must make mRNA. All viral genomes are not mRNAs. Is that clear? Some are DNA. Some are minus RNA. Some are double-stranded RNA. So the reason is because they all have to make uh, mRNA. Now, going beyond the Baltimore scheme, among those seven classes. There's lots of structural diversity among the different kinds of genomes. And these all are obvious. They make perfect sense. For example, you know, whether it's single or double-stranded DNA or RNA, you can have linear genomes, or you can have circular genomes. This goes for both DNA and RNA, although these are, are the DNA. And by the way, the colors I use on all my slides, they're all taken from the textbook. We have a coding scheme for everything. Uh, nucleic acids, blue is DNA, and green is RNA. And then there's a dark and a light blue for the two strands. And then there are two colors of RNA. This uh, greenish color is plus, and the uh, br more brown version, olive, is negative strand RNA. And then proteins are never blue or green because that would confuse you. We make them different colors. Okay? So here's a protein here. 
it's got some kind of orange color to it. So we can have linear genomes like this one, a linear double-stranded uh, DNA genome. We can have circular genomes. This is a circular DNA genome. Uh, the circular genomes can be single or double-stranded. It's quite interesting that they're circularized. Here's a gapped uh, genome. The gapped double-stranded DNA of the hepatinoviruses is actually a circle. This is shown here. You can have segmented genomes. So not all genomes have to be one piece of nucleic acid, just like we have multiple chromosomes. Some viruses can have multiple pieces of uh, nucleic acid. Here's, for example, a segmented negative stranded RNA genome. Uh, RNAs can be single stranded, either plus or minus, as we saw. They can be even ambisense. This is a weird one. They have both plus and minus character in them. Can be double stranded, either RNA or DNA. These are two different kinds. Here's an RNA double stranded, here's a DNA double stranded. Uh, some genomes uh, are attached to proteins. Um, that can be DNA or RNA. There's a protein called VPG attached to the end of this RNA. And above it, there's a double-stranded DNA genome with a small protein called TP attached at either end. And we'll explore what those are doing later on. Some double-stranded DNA viruses, the pox viruses in particular, the ends are actually cross-linked. So in this DNA above it, this linear double-stranded DNA, the, the ends are free. You have five and three prime ends. But here in the, the double-stranded DNA below it, the ends are actually covalently linked. So if you melted this double strand, if you separated the strands, you would have a single-stranded circle. Now this gapped DNA, which I mentioned at the top of hepatinoviruses, is also unusual because uh, it has a protein attached to it, which is this little purple ball here. Uh, but there's also a piece of RNA, if you can see the green color probably more visible in your copies. That's a bit of RNA attached to the genome as well. So beyond the seven different categories, many variations, these I wouldn't expect you to have to memorize because you could figure out how they replicate anyway. What's, what's really important are the seven different genome classes. Now why do we have so many kinds of genomes? We have all kinds of, we have DNA and RNA first of all single double strand, different polarities, gap proteins attached, and so forth. What is the function of that? Well, we can't answer that question very satisfactorily, but there are some clues. First of all, why do we have both DNA and RNA genomes, whereas everything else on the planet today is DNA? Why is it that viruses are the only organisms with RNA genomes? Well, we think that actually RNA appeared on Earth before cellular life, we call this the RNA world. And uh, as soon as Earth cooled down, there were pools of chemicals everywhere. We think RNA arose, and there was a whole world based on RNA. No proteins whatsoever. And we'll talk more about that in our evolution course. But from that RNA world arose the RNA protein world, uh, then the DNA world, and then cells. And some of these RNAs and DNAs early on, we think, were actually self-replicating, so they were a kind of virus that didn't need cells. And we think all life is actually derived from viruses. So think about that. You guys are all derived from viruses. You, you descended from them. You didn't descend from single cells. Before the cells were viruses. It's hard to understand or believe or take, and I, I understand that. But uh, by the end of this course, you'll get used to the fact that you're viral in many ways. So RNA genomes have, have lasted from the RNA world in the form only of viruses. Nothing else remains except RNA viruses. Of course, we have DNA viruses as well because DNA evolved afterwards. Many people think because DNA is more stable, it evolved, but RNA persisted as well. So that's why we have both. So we had a switch to DNA genomes at some point, and today we have the virus. Viruses are the remnants of the RNA world. Uh, linear, circular, segmented, double and single-stranded, plus and minus. These are actually different ways to solve a variety of, pr of problems in replication. So for example, uh, when you replicate DNA, the, the real problem is how to copy the ends. And we'll talk about that specifically when we talk about DNA replication. A circular format gets rid of that issue. You don't have to worry about copying the ends because there aren't any. Nevertheless, both linear and circular genomes exist, they obviously are evolutionarily successful. So my view is that these configurations at the bottom here just work. They work in their particular niche and we really can't understand any particular advantage that they have other than that they have survived. 
So I think you should memorize these seven uh, genome types. You should also know at least one virus that's representative of it. Okay, so for example, uh, the, let's start with one, the double-stranded DNA viruses. We'll be talking a lot about adenoviruses and herpes viruses. In addition, pox viruses, which aren't on this slide. But you should remember at least one of those. Adenoviruses cause common colds and gastroenteritis. And at the moment, some of you may have adenovirus infections, but these are not persistent infections. Whereas all of you, or most of you, probably have some kind of herpes virus infection because you get them early in life and the genome stays with you forever. We'll talk about that. Uh, group two, viruses with single-stranded uh, DNAs. A well-known one is the parvovirus. And these are viruses that if you have a pet, a cat, or a dog, you should immunize them against these viruses, otherwise it could kill them at a young age. Parvoviruses are used extensively for gene therapy because they persist, and we'll talk about that later. Group three, double-stranded RNA viruses. The Rio virus is the family name. But if you've ever had gastroenteritis, vomiting, and diarrhea, a rotavirus, which is one of these real viruses, has probably caused it. Four is poliovirus, the plus-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, the prototype for that will be poliovirus, which is about to be eradicated. Group five, negative-strand RNA viruses, influenza virus. Ebola virus is another example of that, or plus-stranded Zika virus is a plus-strand virus. And uh, group six is, uh, where's group six? Here we go. The guys, the plus stranded RNAs that goes through uh, a DNA intermediate, those are retroviruses, HIV, for example. We will talk a lot about that. And group seven, the hepatitis viruses. But I think it's good for you to know these seven genome types, but put a virus to each one. Otherwise, it's kind of abstract and it doesn't make any sense. Now, there's a very nice website called Viral Zone. The, the URL is viral zone .org. and if you're interested in diving further, this is purely for your enjoyment, they have the Baltimore scheme on the front here, uh, organized by DNA and RNA and so forth, and you can click on either of these. You can click on uh, RNA or the plus minus or double-stranded RNA. So here I've clicked on double-stranded uh, viruses and then a list of all the families below it. And you could drill down more and more and get pictures of the viruses. Here are the double-stranded RNA viruses, real viruses, and you can see all the proteins that are encoded in them and examples of the viruses that are out there causing disease and lots of links. So this is a pretty cool site if you're just trying to figure out what's what. I would go here first because it's got all the answers. So what do you encode in a virus genome? You'll see that some genomes, although we don't call them viruses, encode nothing. They're just RNAs. They are really relics of the RNA world. Remember, the RNA world, the first implementation, version one of the RNA world, didn't encode any proteins. These RNAs were just replicating. And if you think that's weird, people have duplicated this in the laboratory now. They're able to make RNA chains that will replicate themselves in the absence of any proteins. So some of them don't have any, but most uh, virus genomes encode at least one protein. And there are many out there that actually encode only one protein. Uh, nevertheless, some of the things that a virus needs to encode uh, proteins f for, well, signals and proteins for replication of the genome. So not only proteins like polymerases and accessory proteins, but signals in the genome so that the proteins know where to attach. You need to have um, proteins for assembly and packaging of the genome, and you also need to have signals in the genome to specify the assembly. Many viruses <clears throat> uh, have to have proteins that regulate the replication cycle. They have early and middle and late phases. They do things in steps. Not all viruses do that, but the ones that do, they have proteins that take care of this timing. I like to say that every virus on the planet has to encode at least one protein that modulates host defenses. All right, we'll talk about some of these later on. Our immune systems are awesome. We have all kinds of levels. We have intrinsic immunity that's there all the time. We have innate immunity that's induced very quickly. We have adaptive, like uh, antibodies and T cells that take a couple of weeks to kick in. Multiple levels of defenses, and it's really good. If viruses didn't encode antagonists, they'd be gone. So this is, has selected for viruses that have at least one protein that modulate host defenses. We'll talk about some of those later on. They are very, very neat. And finally, Virus genomes have to encode 
proteins that allow them to get out of a cell and spread to other cells uh, and other hosts. Now, what's not encoded in a genome? This is very interesting. This actually changes from year to year. Uh, the first one, no genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. I used to say no genes encoding any part of the protein synthesis machinery. But we discovered big viruses that actually encode amino acyl tRNA synthetases, right, the enzymes that stick the amino acid onto the tRNA. Some viral genomes encode those. Not the whole complement, but some of them. Uh, some viral genomes encode eukaryotic initiation factors that participate in translation. And some viral genomes encode tRNAs. We don't know why they're there. We think maybe they help these viruses replicate in certain cells. You know, cells have distinct um, um, coding repertoires. The triplet code is different, the, the dinucleotide code, the CPG, and so these may help a virus replicate in a certain cell. Was there a question here? Yes, uh, so viruses that don't, how, that don't encode any proteins, how do they, how do they survive? Do so they viruses that, that don't encode any proteins, these are, these are mostly viruses of plants, and they seem to be so they, they have to replicate inside of the plant cell, and they're carried from plant to plant, either by uh, insects or by damage by farm machinery. So they really have been amplified by, by modern farming, and so that's how they get from cell to cell. But it's a naked RNA, which is remarkable, because it's not very stable, but they are short and highly structured, so that's probably how they survive. But they completely depend on everything provided by the host cell. We'll talk about those uh, later on. Right? So they don't... They don't need to get around immunity. They, they do it in other ways. We'll talk about that. Um, no genes encoding proteins involved in energy production or membrane biosynthesis. So viruses can't make energy. They can't make membranes. They depend on the cell for those, for those pathways. No centromeres or telomeres. You know, our, our chromosomes have centromeres uh, and telomeres. We don't find those uh, in, in viral DNAs. And I put the last point on as a uh, kind of safety because it may be that next year we find some of these. When we sequence some of these big viruses, 90% of the genes we don't even recognize. We see an open reading frame for a protein. We have no idea what it is because it doesn't match up any kind of protein that we know of. So maybe there are some uh, proteins and viruses out there that do some of these things, but we haven't found them yet. Maybe some of you will discover them one day. So I find it interesting to look at the big and the small of virus genomes. Here is a list of the biggest uh, known virus genomes, starting with Pandora virus Salinus. And it's 2.4 million bases long, bigger than some bacterial genomes. And it encodes 2,541 proteins. So this was discovered by a team working in France, um, Jean-Michel Claverie and Chantal Abergel. And they were at a meeting in Australia. And he, he was at the break. He looked outside, and there was a muddy lake next to the meeting site. And he took his bottle of water, and he dumped it out, and he went to the lake and filled it, and brought it back to his lab, and he isolated this virus from it. So it came from a muddy lake in Australia. And then you see there's a whole list of slightly smaller genomes going all the way down to 600,000 base pairs. And these are all, all, these are all the giant viruses that have been re really recently discovered. And they encode lots and lots of proteins. I would say that the viruses we knew until these giant viruses were discovered had far fewer uh, than these number of bases and these number of proteins. And again, many of these proteins, we have no idea what they're doing. It's a gold mine for exploration. So those are the biggest genomes. The smallest ones here at the top are the viroids. These are 120 nucleotide single-stranded RNAs that encode no proteins at all. They're simply RNAs. They're highly structured. And so that probably protects them when they're traveling from plant to plant. Um, but they encode no, no proteins whatsoever. And how they replicate in the cell, we'll, we'll talk about in a separate lecture later on. But they have been able to survive. Uh, and they are big crop problems 
Farmers have issues with these. When your crop gets infected, you have to destroy everything and start over again. Yes? What do you mean when you say highly structured? Um, we're going to have a slide in a few minutes that shows that exactly. I'll explain what it is. Yeah. And we have a satellite RNA, which is uh, sort of like a viroid. It doesn't encode any proteins. And then we have a human virus, the hepatitis delta satellite. So satellites depend on a regular non-defective virus to replicate. And so the hepatitis delta is a short RNA that encodes one protein. Well, we have one protein right there. And it will not replicate unless the cell is also infected with hepatitis B virus. So people who have hep B infections may get hepatitis delta. And then you see we have conventional viruses starting with the circovirus, 1,700 a base pair, a single-stranded circular genome. They encode one protein. These circoviruses infect all of you if I took blood from you, you would all show evidence of infection with circoviruses. Everybody on the planet seems to be infected with them. Our blood supply is full of circoviruses. If, and we test our blood for viruses. We find circoviruses. But we have to use it because every pint has circovirus in it. So these are apparently harmless to us, but maybe they're actually helpful. Anelovirus is slightly larger. Again, they infect most of us. They encode four proteins. And, you know, seven and so forth. These are the low ends of virus genomes and virus proteins. Hepatitis B virus is down here at the low end, 3,200 base pairs and seven proteins. So you can see there's an enormous range in genome size, not only configuration, <laughs> genome size, and coding capacity as well. And for those viruses that only encode a few proteins, we pretty, know mu we pretty much know what they do. But for the big ones, we have no clue. It is just very difficult to understand what they're doing because we can't recognize uh, any of the proteins. All right, the next uh, question. What information may be encoded in a viral genome? Gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis, gene products that catalyze energy production, complete protein synthesis systems, centromeres or telomeres, or enzymes to replicate the viral genome. Eighty-five percent of you got the right answer, which is enzymes to replicate the viral genome. Virus do not encode uh, enzymes that can make membranes or energy. They do not encode complete protein synthesis system. They have parts of it, and they don't encode centromeres or telomeres. Now let's start by talking a bit about viral DNA genomes. Our host DNA has our host genome is DNA, of course. And so basically, these DNA viruses are mimicking what we do for the most part in terms of replication. But there are always differences. Viruses, DNA viruses have evolved so that their replication systems are slightly different from ours. And very interesting things have evolved. And we'll talk about those later on when we consider DNA replication. It's probably safe to say that almost all the viral DNA genomes are not like our genomes at all. So, you know, we have chromosomes that are highly chromatinized. The DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes, and it's, again, folded in higher order structures. I would not say that any viral DNA is a chromosome, although you will hear people calling them chromosomes. They are not chromosomes. Chromosome has a specific name to the way uh, animal nucleic acid and plant nucleic acid is folded. So viral DNA genomes uh, take advantage of what, <coughs> excuse me, take advantage of what we do, but they do things differently as well. Now here are some viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, and these are icons that you'll see over and over in this course. At some point, you'll get to recognize them. We have adenoviruses, very unusual. Now we'll talk about virus structure in a bit, but you see this uh, is a virus where the shell is made of pure protein, and it has little projections from it. And when these were first seen in the electron microscope, they looked like Sputniks, and that name has stuck. So these are double-stranded DNA viruses. Here are herpes viruses. Now, they're different. They have a capsid made of protein, like the adenoviruses, in the middle. And the DNA genome is in there. For the adeno, we can't see the DNA genome. But here we've made a cutaway. And around it is a lipid membrane or envelope. So I will call it an envelope sometimes, but it's a lipid membrane or bilayer. It comes from the host cell. So viruses can't make membranes. They always have to take a membrane from the host cell if they're going to have one. But you can see not all viruses have membranes. Papillomaviruses that cause uh, warts 
and various cancers are small DNA containing proteinaceous virus particles. So are the polyomaviruses, uh, which infect many of us as well. And finally, the big virus on this slide is the pox virus. And in this family is the virus that causes smallpox, big DNA, double-stranded DNA viruses with uh, an interesting morphology and a membrane around the outside. But the Mimi and the megaviruses, the giant viruses, make this tiny by comparison. They wouldn't even fit on this slide. Here are the genomes of these viruses and the replication strategies. So we have double-stranded DNA, which you remember is the only kind of DNA that can be transcribed to make mRNA. So when these viruses get in a cell, first thing that can happen is production of mRNA. And that can happen in either the nucleus or the cytoplasm, depending on where the virus is going. So you have mRNA. The mRNA, of course, encodes proteins. Uh, some of those proteins will replicate the DNA genome and eventually go on to make new virus particles. So a rather simple strategy, but don't let this fool you. Some of the um, replication cycles of these viruses are pretty complicated. Now on the bottom are some examples of viral genomes with double-stranded DNA. And there are two classes. On the left are genomes that are copied by the host DNA polymerase. So these are typically small genomes. Here we have polyomaviruses, 5,000 bases of double-stranded circular DNA. The papillomaviruses, 8,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. This can't encode a lot of proteins. So one of the proteins that's left out is the DNA polymerase. The virus is replicated by the host DNA polymerase. All right? And we're going to talk about how a virus can co-opt the DNA polymerase of a cell so that it replicates their genome and not that of the cell. Now, as the genome gets bigger, it has more room to encode proteins. So now the genome can encode a DNA polymerase. So these virus genomes on the right all encode their own DNA polymerase. So for example, uh, the adenovirus is 36 to 48,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. The herpes virus is even bigger, 120 to 220,000 base pairs. Pox virus is 130 to 375,000 base pairs. And all the bigger viruses, up to 2 million base pairs that I showed you, they all encode their own DNA polymerase. So they get in a cell, they first make mRNA, and among the proteins made is a DNA polymerase that will replicate the genome. Now why do some viruses encode a DNA polymerase and others not? Well, one reason is the size of the genome. If it's too small, they simply can't encode it. But if you code your own DNA polymerase, that makes you somewhat autonomous of the cell. You don't have to worry about the cell's bureaucracy. And in fact, some of these viruses, like pox viruses, don't even go in the nucleus. They exist in the cytoplasm. So they're completely independent of what the cell is doing. Now, to make this a little more relevant, if you're going to use the DNA polymerase of a cell, that cell has to be dividing. Because if a cell is not dividing, it doesn't have all the proteins made that you need to replicate DNA. And so this is another obstacle for a virus. And these small viruses that don't encode their own DNA polymerase have to encode other proteins to kick the cell into dividing. It turns out that most of the cells in you are actually not dividing. Some exceptions, of course, are your skin cells, which are always dividing and falling off, making all the dust in the world. Uh, and your intestinal cells, which divide a lot and they fall off every couple of days and they're shed. But all the other cells in us don't need to divide unless you're growing. You've all stopped growing. And so they're not, your muscle cells aren't dividing very much. And so viruses have a hard time if they have to use the DNA polymerase of the cell. Talk about those issues more later. Gap double-stranded DNA genomes, these are the uh, hepatinoviruses. And the main virus here we'll talk about is hepatitis B virus big cause of liver cancer globally. Here is the genome, very unusual, circular DNA. One, the negative strand is a complete circle. The plus strand is not complete. It has a gap, you see, between the three prime and the five prime ends. And the five prime end has a piece of RNA shown in green attached to it. Uh, the negative strand has a protein attached to it. So very unusual, and that cannot be copied to mRNA. Because remember, I told you, this is just something you have to take on faith that only double-stranded DNA can be copied to mRNA. So when this virus infects a cell, here it is at the top here, the DNA goes into the nucleus where the gaps and the protein and the RNA, all that's repaired by cellular repair enzyme. You know, our cells have lots of DNA repair enzymes because we're 
always getting assaulted by DNA damaging agents. And those repair agents will repair the hepatitis B genome. And now it's a nice double-stranded uh, DNA, which can be transcribed to make messenger RNA. And that can then be made into proteins, which will be used to assemble new virus particles. Now, into those new virus particles goes the newly made viral DNA. And it's the gapped and protein-linked and RNA-linked uh, genome that goes in them. You may be wondering why, what kind of process leads to such a weird genome. We'll know, we're going to learn that later on in the reverse transcriptase talk. But what happens is one, some of the mRNAs that are being translated are shifted uh, to a different pool. It's the same plus-stranded RNA, except these are not translated. They're made into DNA, which is then made double-stranded. But it's gapped and has the RNA and protein on it. And those are incorporated into new virus particles. We'll learn how that happens later on. And then finally, single-stranded DNA genomes. We have circular versions uh, shown here on the left. And these are, again, ubiquitous human viruses, circoviruses. And then we have the parvoviruses, uh, which are linear with very unusual T structures at either ends. And we'll talk about their function later on. Uh, but one of them, the B19 parvovirus, is responsible for a common disease of childhood called fifth disease. And again, these are single-stranded, so they can't be copied to messenger RNA, so they have to first be double-stranded. These viruses can package either minus or plus strands. Uh, they're made double-stranded, and you know these viruses don't encode a DNA polymerase. So as soon as these single strands go into a cell, that cell will copy the single-stranded DNA and make it double-stranded. So the cell is carrying out that. It's considered a repair step, much like the gap DNA of hepatinoviruses is repaired. And then the double-stranded DNA can be transcribed by the cell to make mRNA, which then gives rise to proteins. You see, it all makes sense if you remember a few rules, and one of them being double-stranded RNA is the only template uh, for double-stranded DNA is the only DNA template for mRNA synthesis. Next question is, with d which DNA genome on entry into the cell can be immediately copied to mRNA? Double-stranded DNA, gap double-stranded DNA, circular single-stranded DNA, linear single-stranded DNA, or all of them? I think we have student replication as well. We start with 70, and then we end up with 100. Ah, uh, come on, why can't we get 100%? 97% double-stranded DNA. And 1% of you said linear single-stranded DNA. You know, single strands cannot be copied to mRNA. They have to be made double-stranded. And all of the above, well, no, it's just not. <laughs> it's double-stranded DNA only. Now, RNA genomes. Here is an interesting problem. No matter what the virus, there's no cell that can copy an RNA genome. Cells have no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. There's one exception to this, which we'll talk about later on, which is hepatitis delta virus. It's very unusual. It's not copied by an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So you can rest assured that if you make the statement, no cell has an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can copy a viral genome, you will be correct. So all RNA virus genomes have to encode an enzyme, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which I will abbreviate RDRP, to copy their genomes. And this produces genomes and mRNAs, the same thing, or the same enzyme does both things. You have copies of the genomes, and sometimes if it's a negative strand, that's a genome copy, and an mRNA is something different. So these enzymes do both. They make mRNAs, and they replicate uh, the RNA genome. Double-stranded RNA genomes. Here's an example of rotavirus, uh, which is a member of the rheovirus family. It happens to be segmented, double-stranded, and a number of individual double-stranded pieces of RNA. Now, even though there's a plus and a minus strand in these double strands, can the, can the ribosomes access the plus strand? Yes or no? No, can't. It's double-stranded. Ribosome can't get to it. So these viruses have to make an mRNA from that double strand. So they're going to copy the minus strand and make a free mRNA from it. What does that? A cell or a viral enzyme? Cells don't have RNA enzymes that can copy RNA. 
I don't have RNA polymerases that can copy RNA. So this has to be done by a viral enzyme. So now here's the conundrum. And you can walk through the logic if you know all the facts. Here's a double-stranded RNA virus. It, it, the, let's say the RNA gets into the cell. Cell can't do a thing with it. It can't translate it. It can't make an mRNA from it. So by definition, what has to come into the cell in the virus particle along with the RNA? An RNA polymerase, exactly. And that's, you can figure that out now. You have enough understanding of this to do that if, because the cell has no enzymes that can copy RNA. If the RNA in the particle has to be copied to mRNA before infection to proceed, then that virus has to have the RNA polymerase in the particle. So uh, all of the real viruses in the virus particle, there is an RNA polymerase that takes this double-stranded uh, template and makes mRNAs, which can then go on to make proteins uh, new genomes and new particles. <coughs> Let's go to the single-stranded plus sense uh, RNA viruses. And here we have poliovirus and rhinoviruses. The, the family name is shown. It's picorna virus. Calici viruses. These are, these are well-known agents of gastroenteritis. The uh, Norwalk virus or norovirus that infects many of you gives you gastroenteritis. The, the cruise virus, the cruise ship virus, that's a calici virus. Small proteinaceous virus. Here is coronavirus, SARS virus, the MERS coronavirus uh, causing outbreaks in the Middle East is an envelope plus stranded RNA virus. Here are flaviviruses, which are also plus stranded with an envelope. They include yellow fever, West Nile, hepatitis C, and Zika virus, which is rearing its head right now in a big uh, pandemic. And finally, the last member, toga viruses, rubella, equine, encephalitis virus. Uh, these are also plus stranded with an envelope. So how do these work? Uh, these are plus stranded RNAs and all these viruses, the RNA in the virus particle is an mRNA, so it can be translated. So do these viruses have to have a polymerase in the particle? No. no, they don't need it because the RNA can get in the cytoplasm and immediately be translated. It is ribosome ready. And then the translation product includes an RNA polymerase that can then go on to make more genomes. So these are the various RNAs of all those viruses I just mentioned. You can see they have slightly different configurations and different lengths uh, and so forth. Now, messenger RNAs, we'll see later, typically have to have a five prime cap and a three prime poly A, but not all viral mRNAs have those features. You can see some lack three prime poly A and some lack five prime caps. And we'll talk about how viral RNAs get around them for, for translation later on. But basically, these RNAs come into the cytoplasm. They're plus-stranded. They're, they're translated immediately. And that kick-starts the replication cycle. Relatively straightforward. Now we have these wonderful viruses that are single-stranded, plus-sense RNA. But when their RNA comes in the cytoplasm, it is not translated. So this is the one exception you have to remember. But the name of the virus family, retrovirus, will give it away because what these viruses do is change RNA into DNA. We have one viral family, retroviridae, and has two very important human pathogens, HIV and HTLV. And we will be talking about HIV later. It is the only virus in this course that gets a lecture all to its own, because it's really important. So here's the genome of retroviruses. It's capped. It has a poly A tail. It is plus stranded. If you take this RNA out of the virus particle, you can translate it directly. But when it comes into the cell in the virus particle, it is not translated. It is sheltered in a subviral particle so that the ribosomes can't get to it. And instead, it is copied to form a single-stranded DNA and then a double-stranded DNA. That DNA goes into the nucleus and integrates into the chromosome of the cell. It becomes a permanent part of the cell. And there, the DNA in an integrated fashion is transcribed by a cellular polymerase to make mRNA. And the mRNA gives rise to proteins and eventually is packaged into new virus particles. So the virus particles have RNA in them. That is produced by transcription of an integrated DNA. So provirus is a very specific term. It means the integrated DNA copy of the retroviral genome. So when I say provirus, that's exactly what I mean. What's sitting in our chromosomal DNA produced by retroviral infection. We all have proviral DNAs in us. They're not making virus particles, but each and every one of you have them. Uh, it's about 8% of our genome, and we pass them on to our kids because they're in the germline. We'll talk about the implications of that later on. 
and we have our minus sense RNA viruses. So in the virus particle, you have a negative stranded RNA. What has to come into the cell with that RNA in the virus particle? A polymerase, because the cell doesn't know what to do with a negative strand. It can't translate it, and it can't copy it. So you could figure that out. These all, all of these viruses have a polymerase in the particle that you see here. In some cases, it's actually drawn as little circles uh, in the rhabdovirus, the bullet-shaped virus, and in the measles virus. So here we have the paramyxoviruses, which include measles and mumps, uh, rhabdoviridae, rabies virus, phyloviridae, Ebola virus, and Marburg virus, the influenza viruses, the orthomyxoviridae with segmented RNA genomes. So far, these measles, uh, rabies, and Ebola, they all have a single strand of negative sense RNA. The influenza virus is segmented, and the arenaviridae, like Lassa virus, is also segmented but in pieces. These all have envelopes, as you see. Now, I, I point out Lassa virus in particular. There's a wonderful book called Fever by John Fuller. It was written in the 60s. This was about the identification of Lassa virus in the 1960s. It was the first emerging virus that we saw before our eyes, a brand new virus that we'd never seen before. Up until then, we thought we'd discovered them all. And it's a very interesting story because part of it takes place at Columbia Medical Center. I highly recommend it. I had just graduated college uh, in, what year was it? 74, right? And I read this book. I was working as a lab technician. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I read this book and all of a sudden the lights went on and I realized I wanted to be a virologist. So I credit this book with doing that. So I, you should read it. Maybe you'll want to be a virologist as well. Anyway, I owe a lot to that book. I won't be here talking to you if not for that book. It's out of print, so I'm not getting a cut of any of it. So that's not why I'm recommending it. Uh, negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, these have to come in to the cell. In the particle is an RNA polymerase that makes an mRNA. It, that, that gets, that's the one in the box here. And that's translated into proteins. And those proteins can go on and replicate the genome through a plus RNA intermediate. And eventually we have new particles. The flu virus shown here is a segmented RNA genome. We also have negative sense RNA viruses that are non-segmented like measles and rabies virus. But again, the key here is the polymerase is in the particle. Now, when you have a segmented genome, this is very neat because you can do something that other viruses cannot viruses that have a single genome of RNA, you can do something called reassortment. And influenza viruses are the masters of reassortment. Here we have two influenza viruses. They're labeled L and M. You see L has a red RNA and M has a blue one. And um, these are co-infecting a cell and all the RNAs are mixed from both viruses. They're replicating inside the cell. And when you go to make new virus particles, the virus just grabs eight segments from the pool. So you can have uh, both parental viruses, L and M, but you can have recombinant, reassortants. We call these reassortants, not recombinants, which have here, you can see all blue except for that second segment is red. It comes from the other parent. It's called reassortment. It gives a powerful advantage in terms of evolution to these viruses because they can change readily. And that's why we have problems with influenza viruses. Reassortment gives rise to new viruses periodically uh, that cause pandemics. So we'll talk about that quite a bit. The last kind of genome is the ambisense, which has aspects of both plus and minus strands. So here on the top is the genome uh, of these viruses, arenaviruses, Lassa virus has an ambisense genome. You can see part of it at the five prime end is uh, plus sense and part of it is minus sense. Now we call these ambisense, but uh, the, the fact is that the virus particles all have RNA polymerase in the particle. So that tells us that even though there's a plus stranded part of this RNA, it cannot be accessed initially. So the first thing that has to happen uh, when these uh, viruses enter cells is that you get transcription of this negative sense gene down here at the three prime end to make an mRNA, which is then translated. So even though you would say, oh, this could be translated because it's a five prime cap and a plus strand, it's not. So the, the virus is forced to bring in a polymerase in the virion in order to copy it. So those are ambisense genomes. Now I can answer your question about RNA structure. I don't remember who asked it, someone over here, what I meant by structured RNA. So in all these images, I've been drawing RNA as a line. 
but that's not a, at all how it looks. It is actually highly base paired. So when I say a structured RNA, the RNA base pairs with itself to form a variety of structures. We call them stem loops, like this one. So here, these lines represent base pairing between uh, different parts of the same RNA molecule. All right, so that's a stem loop. And you can see these can get very complicated. They can have bulges in the middle, and they can be very extensive, like uh, in this one down here. Like hundreds and hundreds of nucleotides are base paired in various ways. These have functional significance. In fact, most viral RNAs have these structures throughout the genome, and they're binding sites for proteins like polymerases and regulatory proteins and so forth. In addition, not only do these structured elements bind proteins, but they bind each other. You can see in this slide, these colored lines show you uh, parts of these structured elements that are interacting with each other. So let's take uh, the red one, uh, this loop structure here at the left end. This is not base paired. It's in a loop region at the end of a stem. It is actually base pairing with a sequence further downstream. So here's the five prime end of the genome. Here's the three prime end. In addition, this blue sequence is base pairing at the, from the five prime end to one at the three prime end. And you can show experimentally, if you disrupt these long range interactions, the virus can't replicate. So even though I'm showing you linear representations of genomes, remember they are not linear at all. In fact, this picture doesn't even do it justice. They're probably all balled up into very tight structures uh, with extensive base pairing like that. All right, the last question for today, which statement about viral RNA genomes is correct? Uh, Single-stranded plus RNA genomes may be translated to make viral protein. Double-stranded RNA genomes can be directly translated to make protein, plus single-strand RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus-strand intermediate. RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA-dependent RNA polymerases or all of the above. So here, a little bit of equivocating. 67% said A, which is the right answer, plus stranded RNA genomes may be translated. Remember, the retroviruses are not translated and they have plus stranded RNA. Hence, the word may is correct. Some of you said double stranded RNA genomes can be directly translated. They can't be. Because they're a duplex, the ribosome can't access the plus strand. Um, plus, single stranded RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus strand intermediate. If you go back and look at the schemes for the plus stranded RNA, you know to get more plus, you have to go through a minus. You copy the plus, you get a minus. You copy the minus to get more plus. Um, there's no host cell RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So let me just say that again. There is no host cell RNA dependent RNA polymerase. You have to remember that. Because if you do, you can figure a lot of things out. And all of the above would not be right. Now let's talk for the last few minutes about how we manipulate these genomes. Remember in the beginning I said the, the real goal of understanding viral genomes is to manipulate them so we can understand how viruses work, so we can develop therapies, and so, how, so we can use viruses at our bidding to destroy tumors or to deliver drugs. So in the old days of virology, shortly after the plaque assay was developed, people tried to make mutants of viruses and they would have mutations in in individual genes, and they could study those and figure out what the different genes of a virus did. The way they made mutants is they would treat virus stocks with ultraviolet irradiation or with mutagenic chemicals, and then they would do a plaque assay and pick individual plaques, with the idea being that maybe you have different kinds of mutations resulting, and you want to purify one and study it by itself. And this worked for many, many years, but today we don't really use any of that anymore because we have uh, what's called an infectious viral DNA of every virus that we study. So we have DNA copies of every virus genome carried in a bacterial plasmid. I'm sure all of you know what plasmids are. Bacteria, it's a schematic on the bottom, they have a very large bacterial DNA and typically have smaller circular DNAs called plasmids, which replicate on their own within the bacterial cell. And the whole field of recombinant DNA, which arose in the 70s, was all about learning how to take these plasmids and insert sequences that we were interested in them so that we could get lots of DNA and work with it. And so we can take 
a DNA copy of any viral genome and put them in these plasmids and manipulate them. And so these DNAs we call infectious DNAs because we could take, for example, poliovirus RNA, make a DNA copy of it, put it in a plasmid. We put that plasmid into cells by a process called transfection, transformation uh, infection, and out comes virus. So this is a modern validation of Hershey Chase because we're again showing that the viral genome is the genetic material. And this way we can then alter the viral DNA, we can make deletion, insertion, substitution, nonsense, and missense mutations. So transfection, the word that I mentioned I'll use a lot, is the production of infectious virus after putting viral DNA into cells, typically in a viral plasmid, first shown with, with bacteriophage lambda, and that's the derivation uh, of that term. So here's a scheme of this process for poliovirus. Poliovirus is shown here. The RNA is a plus-stranded RNA, which happens to be mRNA. So if you extract poliovirus RNA from the particle and transfect it into cells, it initiates an infectious cycle. So the RNA is infectious. If you make a DNA copy of the viral RNA using reverse transcriptase, which you can purchase, it takes RNA and it makes a DNA copy. You clone the DNA into a plasmid. You grow it up in bacteria, and then you take this plasmid DNA, transfect it into cells, you get virus out because the DNA is also infectious. And you can also put promoters for RNA synthesis in vitro into these plasmids and make RNA in vitro and transfect that into cells and initiate a cycle as well. The whole point of all this is that you can manipulate the virus. You can put genes in it. You can take genes out. You can study how it works. You can use it as a tool. People are using poliovirus to treat gliomas. They've put genes into it that make it safe, and they inject the virus right into the tumor, and it destroys it without causing paralysis. You can do the same thing with influenza virus. And you can take uh, the viral RNA, uh, which is, sorry, down here, it's a negative strand out of the virus particle. Uh, you can make a double-stranded DNA copy of it, which is shown in the middle here. And then you put a promoter at either end to make minus RNA and plus RNA from the same DNA template. So there are eight segments of RNA in, in the influenza virus. So you make eight plasmids of, of double-stranded DNA for each one. You put those eight plasmids into a cell. You get plus and minus strands made. The plus strands, of course, are the messenger RNAs. The minus strands are the genomes. And out comes infectious virus. So this is just another example of how you can make virus from a DNA copy of the genome. And this is a very interesting uh, ability. If in the case of influenza virus, it was used to rescue the 1918 strain. Now, back in 1918, uh, uh, there was a pandemic caused by a very lethal virus. Somewhere between 50 and 100 million people globally died from this infection. But we didn't, we didn't isolate the virus back then. We didn't get influenza virus until 1933. So nobody could study this virus at all until not too long ago. Uh, in 2005, viral RNA was isolated from lung tissue samples that the Army had, had kept. A lot of the people who died of Spanish flu in 1918 were in the Army. So the Army took samples of their lungs and they, they preserved them in uh, paraffin. And these investigators took pieces of those and determined the RNA sequence uh, from those pieces. They also isolated viral RNA from frozen samples uh, of a uh, biopsy of a person that was buried in the permafrost. So, People were buried up in Alaska in parts that remained frozen. They opened the graves and did a biopsy of the lung, and we knew that they died of influenza, and they completed the genome sequence. And from that, they were able to assemble the eight plasmids and recover uh, the virus by transfection of cells. So we have this virus now where it was, it was gone uh, since the end of that pandemic in 1918. We have it. We can develop antivirals. We can understand why it was so lethal. Now, of course, you have to work with this under very high containment. Because if you infect yourself, you're likely to die. Now, all of this is, called, is what I call synthetic virology. You may have heard the term synthetic biology, creating life from DNA. Well, here we can make viruses from a DNA sequence. If you give me a sequence on a piece of paper of a viral genome, uh, in a few days, I can make a virus for you. And so many people are concerned about this. I look at it as great because we can do experiments and understand viruses and use them. But there are many people out there who don't understand uh, the, the implications of it. So the government, in typical fashion, the US government has formed a committee called the NSABB, uh, which is supposed to oversee this kind of research. 
And some of it could be considered what we call dual use research. It has good parts, but somebody could use it for bad things as well. And so it's this job of this committee to oversee research on this sort of work. For example, if you wanted to work with the 1918 influenza virus, your protocol would have to go by this committee and, and they'd have to approve it. So influenza virus and any of a number of very dangerous viruses are subject to this kind of regulation. So my last word to you, in science, progress propels every field forward, but at every step, people get afraid of what we can do and it's something we always have to deal with.